Good day, folks. So here we are. Another week's gone by. And uh, I'm so glad to be here with you. I thank you so much for listening or watching or however you want to look at it. These videos that we post uh, on behalf of the church on, online. And I thank you for inviting me into your places. I hope you've had a blessed day and Today we want to turn our attention again to Psalm 119 as we continue uh, down that uh, sermon series, uh, The Path to Life. Um, came across a Wikipedia article which described John Adams as an American statesman, attorney, diplomat, writer, and founding father of the United States. Now being a Canadian, uh, uh, the import of that probably isn't, doesn't weigh as heavily on me as it might if you are an American listening to this. But certainly, uh, um, we, when I grew up, we learned a lot of this stuff in school in those days. I'm not sure if that's what they learned in Canada today. But anyways, it was during the later years of the American Revolution that Adams would become the first person to hold the office of the Vice President of the United States. You know, the United States being a brand new nation at the time. Of course, later, Adams would go on to serve as the second President of the United States. I hope you know who the first one was, if you're an American. Uh, President John Adams uh, once said this, quote, The longer I live, the more I read, the more patiently I think, and the more anxiously I inquire, the less I seem to know. So Adams concluded, Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. This is enough. Now, fast forward to our era, our time here. Uh, Professor Trevin Wax, in one of his articles, focuses on the subject of mercy kind of doing a little switch here, uh, subject of mercy in relation to the wider church. And he said this, the church should be a place of mercy and kindness in a world of constant, constant judgment. The church should be a place of, quote, compassion and a refuge in a world of cruelty. A place of, quote, clemency in a time of canceling. Well, with this in mind, Wax went on to ask some questions of the wider church. He asked, what form should mercy take? What does mercy look like? And what does it require? And he asked these probing questions in view of his perception or his study of, if better to say study of our current culture, which he called an era of expressive individualism. In a culture where he, uh, Trevin suggests where the purpose of life is to find and express yourself, a time where you and I turn to therapy to help us with our problems, where we examine our uh, past with a fine-tuned comb, our past and present environments to better understand the sins we've committed. Now, he acknowledges while these approaches can be helpful, he goes on to argue convincingly the desire of the wider church to be a place of mercy and compassion has been diluted, has become vague. So the question is why and how. Now, we can't get into all the details, but let me just share, you, share a few of his points. First of all, he would say, because we go to therapy. Not sure the connection there, but that's just one of his points. And as we examine our past and present environments, this line of, of inquiry, Trevin suggests, is merciful toward the sinner, but not so much toward the sinned against. He goes on, he goes a step further when he said this, quote, even mercy toward the sinner gets diluted in this era of expressive individualism. And he warns the church, quote, beware the, merciful, <coughs> pardon me. beware the mercilessness that masks itself as mercy. So with these introductory comments, um, I draw our attention to the prophet Micah, who said, listen to what the Lord says. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Find that in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119. Uh, we're almost there at the end of it. We're beginning today in verse 153. Psalm 119, verse 153, down to 160. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. And great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my advisor, uh, adversaries, but I do not swear from your testimonies. 
I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. And the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you for this time. We do thank you for your tender mercies, which are new every day. That's what your word says. That's what we believe. And as we look at the mercy of God today in this particular stanza, help us, O oh Lord, by your spirit to sort out those things that are in the way, whatever that may be. O oh Lord, may this message be something that not only um, gives us strength and courage in the midst of our own trials and tribulations, but gives us hope that one day all this will be justly dealt with, whatever we're dealing with, whether, whatever we're seeing around this world. For indeed, you are the just Lord of all things. And we thank you, Lord. I pray for each one that is listening to this. I pray, God, that you bless them. Give them the strength to carry on throughout this day and into the week. And, Lord, that they would walk in the, grow, in the knowledge and grace of Christ, that they would be uh, there with their lips and with their actions and with their minds, uh, play, praising God and glorifying Christ in their day-to-day -day worlds. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you were with us last week, we spent a considerable amount of our time uh, considering the psalmist's lament as described for us in verse 145 to 152. We see there that the, law, the psalmist had cried out, With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. Then he said, I call to you, save me. I rise before dawn and cry for help. We find that in verse 145 to 147. Because of her, it was those who persecuted the psalmist with evil purpose and they had drawn near to the psalmist that he cries out in this lament. And in the midst of his lament and affliction from his enemies, enemies, the psalmist said this, but you are near, O Lord. And we saw that the nearness of God coming alongside his perfect word was the comfort and life that the psalmist needed in his trials. And this, of course, we also saw last week, was in vivid contrast to his persecutors, who the psalmist described as far from the law in verse 150, which is really also saying that they were far from God. He was near to God, they were far from God. So now today, as we look at our, uh, at our stanza, we find, as one commentator put it, quote, the lament intensifies as the psalmist prays for deliverance, mercy, and life. Please notice with me verse 153. Let's take a look at that briefly. Look on my affliction and deliver me. So this is, uh, this is what we've been saying from the very beginning uh, of this sermon series. This is not a made-up story. This was a real person living a real life uh, a long time ago. A person who act, interacted with other real people. And some of those real people we find here in this stanza had become his enemies. They had become what he describes as my persecutors and my adversaries, verse 157. And 157 also describes that the psalmist had many persecutors, many adversaries. So it was there in the valley of life's reality that the psalmist prayed that God would defend him. Verse 154, the psalmist said, Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. This phrase, plead my cause, is translated by the NIV, defend my cause, has a legal sense to it. The Hebrew translated by the ESV and NIV, my cause, is a term used for a proceeding in a court of law. And this is reinforced by the Hebrew verb translated plead, by the NIV and translated defend by the, uh, pardon me, trans translated plead by the ESV and defend by the NIV. And I think the NIV has really captured what seems to be the fuller or deeper meaning with the word defend. The psalmist appealing to God to defend his case before his adversaries, his accusers. Others have done this in the Bible as well. King David, we, we see him doing this more than once. King David prayed to God to defend himself against his adversaries, and he said this, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Psalm 35, verse 1. We can even go to Jeremiah chapter 50, and there we find God's response to 
Babylon's oppression of his people. Jeremiah said, the people of Israel are oppressed and the people of Judah are with them. All who took them captive have held them fast. They refuse to let them go. Their redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will surely plead their cause. There's that phrase, that legal phrase, that he may rest to the earth. He may give rest to the earth, but unrest to the inhabitants of Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 33 to 34. Well, we go back to our text with this in mind. And before we just dig a little deeper into the, in the, to the topic of the mercy of God, please notice again a continuing contrast. A contrast between <clears throat> a servant of God who in his affliction was drawn near to God. We see this when he said, I do not swerve from your testimonies, verse 157. And this is in vivid contrast to his persecutors, his adversaries who are far from God. And he describes them this way. They do not seek your statutes, do not keep your commands. Verse 155, verse 158. Well, we can go to the New Testament and the Apostle Paul helps us with some commentary in this regard. We find there in uh, Paul writing to the church in Colossae, after describing just before this verse that we're going to read together, uh, the preeminence of Christ. And Paul said this, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, 22. You see, the believers, Paul said here, in Colossae were once alienated or hostile to God. In other words, they were far from God. He uses that faraway language in his letter to the Ephesians as well. And Galatians, something like that anyways. They were far from God. That is, though, until the death and resurrection of Christ, where they were reconciled, as Paul would say, brought near to God. In other words, Paul would go on and say they were made holy and blameless and above reproach before him, Colossians 1.22. My friends, this is an effect, the picture we have here in our stanza. The contrast between the enemies of the psalmist who were hostile to the things of God, far from God, the psalmist describes them as faithless, verse 158. The original meaning of this word is someone who acts treacherously, someone who wants to do wrong against someone by an act of treachery. But the psalmist, a servant of God, he had been reconciled to God, was near to God. So friends, it was in the valley of trials and tribulations the psalmist presented his case depending on the mercy of God. And he said, Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Verse 156. We can go to James and his closing remarks in the New Testament letter that he wrote. There he encouraged his readers to be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, James 5 and 7. And then he gives an example of patience from his first century context, an example that some of you might even understand today. He pointed to the farmer who waits patiently for the crop on harvest day. Then James gave, James gave, gave another example, an example and I'll just read what he said, an example of suffering a patient. He said, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We consider those blessed who remain steadfast, James 5, 10, and 11. Then James offered up Job as another example of one who was unwavering in their suffering. And finally, John, James said, you have seen the purpose of, of the Lord. He gives them the purpose of this, why God allowed this, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Actually, how God is simply compassionate and merciful. Someone once said, quote, mercy holds back from us what we really deserve. Grace gives us what we do not deserve. So, you know, when we come across a passage like this here in the stanza, in the stanza, it would be wise for us to ask ourselves, what is the context revealing about God? And as we look at the bigger picture of all that we've covered in Psalm 19, my hope is that you've been blessed to discover God in his awesome splendor. God, who is in such a marvelous way, invites you and me to grow in our knowledge and grace. 
of our Savior as revealed here in this ancient Hebrew poetry. Have we not, if you considered this as we come this far, have we not discovered the righteousness, the goodness, the kindness, uh, the love, the justice, and the holiness of, of the eternal triune God? Therefore, we discover that in the life of this ancient servant of God, we discover the God of mercy. For he did say, the psalmist did say, Great is your mercy, O Lord, verse 156. Now when we think of uh, any doctrines of God, whether, whatever kind of theology we're talking about, systematic theology, biblical theology, those ologies, we need to be sure to understand that the Word of God is where we find the source of the doctrine of God. That's our source. We, not, not a commentary, not somebody who wrote a book. No, no, our source is the Word of God. That's where we have to go first. Over this course of these uh, sermons in this, in this particular psalm, we've used the Lexham Survey of Theology just to help us navigate uh, some of this material. And today we're using it, the Lexham again, just briefly concerning the mercy of God. So let's apply the KISS principle, keep it simple, sweetie, and say that the mercy of God is one, communicable, two, relational, three, a vital characteristic of God's grace. So let's just take these one at a time. I'm not going to spend too much time here, so uh, if you want to take notes, it's a good time to do it. First, the mercy of God is a communicable attribute of God that you and I can imitate, can possess in our relationships. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, began with what we call the Beatitudes. And he said this about mercy. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Matthew 5, verse 7. We go to Luke's Gospel, and there records a time when Jesus was tested. We know Jesus was tested often. And he was asked by a Pharisee, and this particular Pharisee was a lawyer of the law, the law, the Torah. He asked, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You'll find this whole event in Luke chapter 10 from 25 to 37. And Jesus responding by, responded by asking this lawyer a question, what is written in the law? And the Pharisee responded by quoting Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. In other words, the two greatest commandments. You know, love the Lord your God with all your strength, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus replied to the Pharisee, you have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. But as we understand uh, the nature of many of the Pharisees, they were always trying to attempt to justify their interpretation of the law and their actions. They, uh, this uh, lawyer challenged Jesus by saying, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then tells this parable of a man as he was traveling, uh, was, lay, lay, was waylaid and by bandits, he was beaten, he was robbed and left for dead. Then along came a Jewish priest, saw the man on the ground, passed by him on the other side. Then along came a Levite, saw the man on the ground, he also passed by on the other side. Then along came a Samaritan, who saw the man on the ground, had compassion, and applied first century first aid. He put this man on the donkey, he brought him to the nearest inn, and he cared for him. The next morning, upon his departure, he told the innkeeper, if there's any more additional charges that he might incur on behalf of this injured man, that he would make up for that on his return next time. Then Jesus asked the Pharisee, which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man and fell among the robbers? And the Pharisees replied, and the Pharisee replied, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Now friends, when we consider our merciful God, when we consider the attribute that God possesses, this mercy, we mustn't think of mercy simply just as a characteristic of God, one that we do share. Because throughout the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, uh, we see God displaying his mercy by his actions on behalf of undeserving people. Uh, ponder this for, with me for a moment. You know, we look at our culture today, we look at the commercials and all the advertisements, the ideology, the philosophies. Certainly, certainly, uh, one thing we are told is that we deserve. We deserve a new car, we deserve a, a vacation, we deserve a comfortable life. We deserve fill in the blank. Remember what we said earlier. 
Mercy holds back from us what we really deserve. Let me ask you this question. Why did Jesus suffer and die on the cross? You might find a break in the video here. I just got interrupted and I had to go deal with that. So let me get back here to the question. Why did Jesus suffer and die on the cross? Then let me ask you, did he deserve the Roman cross? How about this question? Does God owe you and me? You know, as we survey the word of God, over and over God demonstrates by his actions his mercy by saving, redeeming, and restoring people. You know, we have to be thankful for the mercy of God, and maybe as the people of God, we will keep this in the front of our minds as we, uh, in our own actions as well, uh, as we relate to one another and those around us. So one, the mercy of God is a communicable attribute of God. Two, the mercy of God is relational. That is, mercy is an expression, my friends, of God's character, which flows from his love, his goodness, his kindness. Ephesians, uh, Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, goes on and says it this way. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. In this very Ephesians, uh, Ephesian passage, we find the third aspect of God's mercy, the vital connection with his grace. For Paul would go on to say, by grace you have been saved. That's in verse 5 of chapter 2. We can even go to the writer of the Hebrews, who describes for us the merciful grace of God at work in a believer's life. And these believers that he was writing to, that letter to the Hebrews, uh, they were struggling with affliction and trials and persecution as well. He said, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need, Hebrews 4, 16. So we see this vital connection of God's mercy and his grace also in the Apostle John's letter, particularly in his greeting. In his second letter, John said, grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Son, Father's Son in truth and love. 2 John, verse 3. So one, God's mercy is communicable. Two, it is relational. Three, it is a vital characteristic of God's grace, my friends, which has been made manifest since the time the church began in the body of Christ with that covenant relationship that we have with God in Christ. Let's go back to our text. We see here the psalmist that had made his appeal in the face of his accuser simply on the basis of the merciful God. The psalmist praying in expectation that a merciful God would willingly and powerfully act as he had done before in his life. We can turn to 2 Samuel verse 11 and 12. There we find a story of adultery and conspiracy and murder. The perpetrator, none other than King David. And then when Nathan, the prophet, outed King David for a sin, we have a record of David's prayer to God in response David said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Psalm 51.1. Then he would continue, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And then he prayed this, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So friends, the King, King David and the psalmist praying in the expectation that a merciful God would willingly and powerfully act as he had done before. Friends, mercy comes in all kinds of circumstances and situations throughout the course of human history. We could say it in another way, mercy comes in all shapes and sizes, to use that sort of phraseology. And sometimes mercy shows up in unexpected places. The time was December 1943, the place somewhere over Germany. There in the skies, we find one American B-17 bomber and one German pilot by, by the name of, uh, one German ace by the name of Hans Steigler in his Messerschmitt fighter with his sights on the B-17 and his figure on the, on the trigger. And one brief moment of hesitation, Seigler wondering why the B-17 wasn't defending itself. He noticed that one gunner was dead and most of the crew were injured. The infamous B-17 riddled with bullets and struggling even to stay in flight. 
Shooting the B-17 down was in Steigler's mind nothing more than killing men in, bull in cold blood. Then Mercy showed up. Steigler pulled up close to the B-17 and signaled to the pilot and flew with the bomber to prevent it from being targeted by German anti-aircraft fire. Steigler escorted the American bomber to the North Sea, saluted his enemy and broke off his escort. Fast forward now five decades from that time, American pilot Charles Brown tracked German pilot down and Charles Brown and Hans Steigler became best of friends. See, Mercy showed up high in the skies of war-torn Germany and his name was Hans Steigler. There's another time, another place, the very one who is mercy, the very one who is just and righteous and holy and loving and kind and good, was born in a stable in an undescriptive nowhere town outside of Jerusalem. And he would live and die and rise again, ascend to his father's right hand to intercede for you and me. Among and before he breathed his last, pardon me, before he breathed his last breath on the brutal Roman cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Friends, mercy holds back from us what we really deserve, and grace gives us what we do not deserve. Lord God, I thank you for your mercy and kindness. And I look at my own life, and, and I'm absolutely humbled at your mercy and kindness in my life. I pray for my friends who are listening to this, I pray, God, that you would be mercifully and kind with them as you are with so many. And, Lord, I pray that they would turn to you in the moments of their trials and afflictions, whatever it may be, from serious physical health, financial, relational, whatever it may be, or a combination of many things, whatever they're struggling with, even if it's a deep, deep sin that's got a hold of them, I pray, God, they would turn to you and call out, like the publican, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me. And I thank you, Lord, that you are a merciful God and a kind God and a good God and a just God and a holy God. And Lord, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Have a good day. Shalom.